So far in this section, we've made some huge leaps. We've defined this concept of the derivative concretely by putting together what we learned in the first section where we took kind of an overview of calculus and figured out that we want to know the slope of the tangent line to a function at a given point and combining that with what we learned about limits in the previous section. The key idea that this kind of all hinges upon is that secant lines, loosely speaking, turn into tangent lines when the two points that define the secant line get infinitely close together. But we can't go on loosely speaking in a math class. We have to define this stuff concretely. And fortunately, once we learn limits, we can do all that. This formula down here is kind of amazing. And I know I've talked a lot about it already, but I want to talk about it just a little bit more to make sure that this makes all the sense in the world to you. What we did with this formula is we came up with an expression for the slope of the secant line when the two x values were two and two plus h. And that might've seemed a little bit weird to not give a numeric value for the second x value, but by calling the second x value two plus h, we can modify this expression that gives the slope of the secant line between these two different x values into an expression that gives the slope of the tangent line by considering the limit as h approaches zero. Because look, when h approaches zero, the two x values are gonna get infinitely close together. That idea is kind of the key to calculus one, and it's really cool. What I wanna do in this video is give you another way to think about this same idea. It involves this formula here, which is very similar to the one that I had here. The one that I had here was also technically correct, but I think this is the way you'll see it written more commonly, and this will make a little bit more sense. So ignore what was in the notes and consider this version. Much like the formula that you see up here, if you're not taking a calculus one class, this is just a big jumble of symbols with no real meaning. But if you're starting to pick up some Calculus One stuff, you might be able to piece together some really cool ideas that exist in this formula. Much like the formula above, what we start out with is the slope of the secant line. But this time, what's inside the green box looks different than what we had inside the green box way up here. The difference is up here, the two x values that define the secant line were two and two plus h. Down here, the two values that define the secant line are x and then a. The other point that we eventually want to get really close to our initial point that we want to use to define the tangent line is no longer defined in terms of this point. In both cases, one of our two x values is the letter x, but in this video, I'm switching the other point from x plus h to just a. I'm not defining the second point in terms of the first point. I'm defining the second point all by itself. How would that work if these were your two different x values? Well, remember the slope of the secant line is the change in the y values over the change in the x values. If you want m is equal to y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. So if I call x1 the letter x and x2 the letter a, then my denominator should be x2 minus x1. In other words, a minus x, just like you see right here. And my numerator should be y2 minus y1 the way I figure out a y value corresponding with the given x value is I plug it into the function. So y2 would be what comes out of the function when I put x2 into it. y2 would be f of a. Similarly, y1 would be what comes out of the function when I put x1 into it. So y1 is f of x. And you kind of see how this formula here gives the slope of the secant line if this is what I'm calling the two different points. If so, that's great. You're picking up everything perfectly. What we're going to do is we're going to modify the slope of the secant line by considering the limit, but it's a different limit this time. Before, the limit was the limit as h approached zero. And that was important because the way we're going to make these two x values converge, or maybe more specifically, the way we're going to make the second x value approach the first x value is by letting h approach zero. But down here, that's not what we want to do. We don't want the limit as h approaches zero. We want the limit as a approaches x, as that second x value approaches the first value. We're doing the exact same thing down here as we did up above, which is why our answer gives us the exact same thing, the derivative. It's just a different way of thinking about things. And by thinking about things a little bit differently, the algebra will be a little bit different. And having two different ways to do a given problem is kind of nice because it gives us the freedom to choose whichever way we prefer. And since the algebra is gonna be different in the two different cases, maybe there'll be cases where we prefer to do things the old way, the difference quotient way, and maybe there'll be cases where we prefer to do things the new way, the definition of the derivative way. 
If I'm being perfectly honest with you, I'm a little bit biased. I kind of think the algebra is easier in the difference quotient way. Why? What's nicer about above? Generally speaking, zeros in math make stuff work out really nicely. So I like considering the limit as H approaches zero as opposed to the limit as A approaches X. But what I wanna show you in this video is both ways work and it'll be useful for you to know both ways. However, for the sake of being transparent and as honest with you as possible, you can be totally fine in this class never using the definition of the derivative to solve a problem. I will always give you the option and I will always be perfectly content if you can do things using the definition of the derivative or the difference quotient. I can't necessarily guarantee that your next calculus teacher will feel the exact same way. So I want to make sure that I teach you both, but I promise to always give you the freedom to choose whichever method you prefer. Without further ado, let's do some examples. This one might look kind of familiar. F of X is X cubed minus two, and we're supposed to find F prime of three. In fact, that's the exact same question that we did in the previous section. Same function, we're looking for the exact same thing. The answer that we figured out before was 27. If this new formula really does work, we should get the exact same answer. Maybe the steps will just feel a little bit different than the steps that we did right here. Let's do it. We have a formula for f prime of x. We want to find f prime of 3. So what we're going to do is we're going to change all the x's into 3's. f prime of 3 is equal to the limit as a approaches 3 of f of a minus f of 3 divided by a minus 3. What is a? a is just a variable in this problem that we're eventually going to get rid of when we consider the limit. It's kind of the analog to h up above, where it's just a letter that floats around in the problem for a little while until we evaluate the limit and then it goes away and changes into a number. This might be too early to pause and try this on your own, but if you're feeling really ambitious, you could give it a shot. Even if you couldn't solve the problem, you could probably get started. You could figure out f of a and f of 3. To figure out f of a, just copy f of x here, changing all the x's into a's. So f of a would just be a cubed minus 2. From that, I want to subtract f of 3. You can figure out f of 3 pretty easily. Again, just copy everything you see here, changing all the x's into 3's. I got 3 cubed minus 2, 27 minus 2, I guess I got 25. Then I want to divide that by a minus 3. Maybe I clean things up just a little bit. Minus two, minus 25, I can combine like terms and call that minus 27. So I get the limit as a approaches three of a cubed minus 27 divided by a minus three. Question, can you evaluate this limit? Well, I mean, I guess I can try. Before when it was the limit as h approached zero, I tried just changing all the h's into zeros. And what typically happened is I'd get zero over zero because there was a removable discontinuity. And then I'd have to algebraically get rid of that removable discontinuity to change the expression into something that's continuous at that point. So that it's easy to evaluate the limit. Man, that's a lot of math jargon there. If you could follow all that, that's really good. Anyways, the point is the same thing's gonna happen. I mean, try changing all the a's into threes to evaluate this limit if you want. 3 cubed is 27, 27 minus 27 is 0. 3 minus 3 is 0, I get 0 over 0. This expression is undefined when a equals 3. That doesn't mean the limit is undefined though. What it means is that I have to cancel out this a minus 3 with an a minus 3 that's up in the numerator. Here's where the algebra gets a little bit tricky. That a minus 3 up in the numerator is hidden pretty well. It's there for sure, there's an a minus 3. But what I need to multiply the a minus 3 by to recover this a cubed minus 27 isn't obvious at all. If you're familiar with a difference of cubes formula, you could apply that here. But I know from experience that most students aren't. If you're really good with polynomials, you might be able to just talk yourself into this. Be like, well, there'd have to be an a squared here because a squared times a would give me the a cubed. But the a squared times a negative 3 would give me negative 3a squared. And I'm not supposed to have a negative 3a squared. There's not supposed to be any a squared up here at all. So there must be a positive 3a squared to cancel out that negative 3a squared. How can I get a positive 3a squared? By putting a plus 3a here. Because this 3a times this a gives me the positive 3a squared, which cancels out with this negative 3a squared, which gives me the 0a squared that I see up top. But there's a problem with this 3a. This 3a times this negative 3 gives me negative 9a. And I'm not supposed to have negative 9a. I'm not supposed to have any a's at all. So how can I get rid of that negative 9a? Well, by putting a positive 9 right here. Because the 9 times the a gives me a positive 9a. And sure enough, the 9 times the negative 3 gives me the negative 27. If you're really good with polynomials, you might be able to talk yourself into going from this line to this line. If you're not, you might have to use polynomial long division and do a minus 3 divided by a cubed plus 0a squareds plus 0a's minus 27. 
Instead of just writing a cubed minus 27, it's useful to put in these zeros as kind of placeholders here. And then go through your polynomial long division algorithm. Toss an a squared up here, because a squared times a gives me the a cubed. a squared times negative 3 gives me negative 3a squared. And then I got to subtract. Be a little bit careful with your subtraction. This column goes away, but 0a squared minus negative 3a squared is the same as 0a squared plus 3a squared. So I get a positive 3a squared here, not a negative 3a squared. Bring down your 0a and then repeat your algorithm. Toss a 3a up top. That gives me 3a squared minus 9a and then subtract. When you subtract, this column goes away. This column turns into positive 9a. Bring down the negative 27. Toss a 9 up here. That gets rid of everything. We get the same answer that a cubed minus 27 divided by a minus 3 gives me a squared plus 3a plus 9. In other words, a squared plus 3a plus 9 times a minus 3 is the same as a cubed minus 27. So I can replace this line with this line. It's easy to get lost in all the algebra, but what we did is we found the a minus 3 that we knew was hidden up top. How do we know that there is an a minus 3 up top? Because when we tried changing all the a's into 3's up top, 0 came out. That means that 0 is a root of this polynomial, which means a minus 3 is a factor of this polynomial. We knew there was an a minus 3, we just didn't know what the other factor is. Now we do know, now we can cancel out the a minus 3's. Be a little bit careful in this step. Definitely make sure you write the limit as a approaches 3, because if you just cancel out these a minus 3's and get a squared plus 3a plus 9, your equal sign wouldn't be valid because this expression is not the same as this expression because they evaluate to different numbers when I plug three in. However, their limits are the same because all I'm doing when I cancel out these a minus threes is getting rid of the removable discontinuity at three. So the limits are the same. So if I can evaluate this limit, I get my answer. And the great thing about this limit is I can evaluate it because it's continuous at three. Just change all the a's into threes. I get three squared plus three times three plus nine. I get nine plus nine plus nine. I get 27, the exact same answer that I got up here. Kind of cool that you get the exact same answer. However, I think that the algebra down here is a little bit harder. The reason I think the algebra down here is a little bit harder is because our denominator is not just the letter H. It's nice when the denominator was just the letter H because that made it a lot easier to cancel out that problematic H. It's easier to cancel out something that's only one term than it is to cancel out something that's two terms like this A minus three. That's what makes this algebra a little bit more complicated. But it works, you get the exact same answers, and there are benefits to using the definition of the derivative at times, so now you've seen how. I wanna do two more examples without this video being painfully long, so I'm gonna to try to fire through the next two examples pretty quickly. The next two examples are the exact same two examples that you saw in the previous video. Find f prime of one for this radical function and f prime of two for this rational function. The only difference is now we're gonna use the definition of the derivative. So if I want f prime of one, that's gonna be the limit as a approaches one of f of a minus f of one divided by a minus one. F of a is exactly what I see right here, except change all the x's into a's. So it's the square root of 10 minus a. F of one is exactly what I see right here, except changing all the x's into ones. So it's the square root of 10 minus one. 10 minus one is nine. The square root of nine is three. And then the denominator, I got a minus one. This is a limit I'd like to evaluate. You can try changing all the a's into ones, but you won't get anywhere. You'll get zero over zero. What that means is there's an a minus one hidden up in the top. How do I find that a minus one that's hidden up in the top? Exact same trick that we did before. Wait, what trick was that? Remember the trick when we're dealing with radical functions is to multiply by the conjugate. So I got the square root of 10 minus a as my first term over here. And I got a three as my second term over here. And between those two terms, there's a minus sign. If I want the conjugate, I change the sign between those two terms. So now it's a plus sign. If I'm gonna multiply the top by the square root of 10 minus a plus three, I better also multiply the bottom by the square root of 10 minus a plus three. It looks like I've just made this problem horribly ugly, but it's gonna work out pretty nicely because multiplying by a conjugate is awesome. Square root of 10 minus a times the square root of 10 minus a is just 10 minus a. Think we're squaring the square root. Square root of 10 minus a times three is the same as the square root of 10 minus a times negative three, except one's negative and one's positive, so those cancel out. Negative three plus three gives me negative nine. 
The denominator is a huge mess, and if you really felt like it, you could foil out the denominator, but I would not recommend it, because if you do that, you're gonna lose the a minus one that we wanna cancel out. Remember, we're looking for an a minus one on the top and an a minus one on the bottom. We already had the a minus one on the bottom. Don't go losing that thing. Leave it factored out. Just copy the square root of 10 minus a plus three down on the bottom here. I guess I could clean the top up a little bit. 10 minus nine is one, so I have one minus a up top. Oh, so close. I wanted it to be a minus one, but instead it's one minus a. That's too bad. I must have screwed something up. Nah. One minus a is almost the same as a minus one. All you gotta do is factor out a negative. The negative of a minus one is the same as one minus a. Don't believe me? Take the negative and distribute it through. You get negative a plus one, and negative a plus one is the same as one plus negative a, which is one minus a. What I'm saying is 10 minus a minus nine is one minus a, which you can write as negative a minus one. There's that a minus one that I was looking for up in the top. There's the a minus one that I already had in the bottom. I can now cancel out those a minus ones, which produces a different expression, but an expression that has the exact same limit as this expression that I have over here. Get the limit as a approaches one of negative one divided by the square root of 10 minus a plus three. What's this limit equal to? Well, if I change all the a's into ones, I get negative one divided by the square root of 10 minus one, Square root of 10 minus one is the square root of nine, which is three. So I get negative one over three plus three. I get negative one sixth, which hopefully is the exact same answer that I got when I did this using the difference quotient. Yeah, look at that, calculus works. Was that easier or harder this time? I don't know. I mean, I kind of think that when you have radical functions, the definition of the derivative, this new way, and the difference quotient, this old way, is about the same difficulty level. I don't think anything we did up here was any easier or harder than what we did down here. Although I'd argue that the old way was easier when we had this cubic function. What about rational functions? Let's do this one last time. Our formula up here gives us f prime of x. We're trying to figure out f prime of two. So we want the limit as, instead of a approaches x, we want a approaches two. What are we taking that limit of? Well, instead of f of a minus f of x, divided by a minus x, we want f of a minus f of two, divided by a minus two. And since f of x is defined to be five over two x, f of a would be five divided by two a. f of two would be five divided by two times two, in other words, four. And then in the denominator, I just have this a minus two. I'd love to evaluate this limit by just changing all the a's into twos, but I'm not even gonna bother because I know what's gonna happen. I'm gonna get zero divided by zero. Top's gonna be the same as the bottom. I got this removable discontinuity. It's the same old story. I gotta cancel out the a minus twos. There's the a minus two down on the bottom. That's easy to find. The a minus two up top is a little bit harder to find, but by using the tricks that we've learned, I bet we can find it. We wanna make this a fraction divided by a fraction. Right now we have a difference of fractions up in the numerator. So what we have to do is figure out how to subtract these two fractions. Well, they'd have to have a common denominator. What's the least common denominator? I think 4a is gonna be the least common denominator, right? I'll multiply this side by two over two to get 10 over 4a. And I'll multiply this side by a over a to get negative 5a over 4a. Now that my fractions up here have the same denominator, I can subtract them. 10 over 4a minus 5a over 4a is just 10 minus 5a divided by 4a. What I've done is I've changed the top here into a single fraction, which is awesome. That's kind of what my goal was. The bottom, a minus two is easy to make a fraction, just divide it by one. I got a fraction divided by a fraction. That's something that I can deal with. The way I divide fractions is I multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator. So instead of 10 minus 5a over 4a divided by a minus two over one, I got 10 minus 5a over 4a times one over a minus two. Remember this a minus two is the one that I'm trying to get rid of. Here it is right here. It'd be awesome if there was an a minus two up here that I could cancel this out with. Is there? Yeah, absolutely there is. You just have to factor to see it. If I pull a negative five out of each of these terms, what I'd have left over here would be negative two and what I'd have left over here would be positive a. In other words, a minus two. Factor out a negative five, you got a minus two up in the top. Still got this four a down on the bottom. Still got this one. Still got this a minus two. Now I can cancel out these a minus twos. That changes from a limit evaluated at a removable discontinuity to a limit evaluating at a point of continuity. The limit as a approaches two of negative five divided by four a is easy to figure out. 
change all the a's into twos. I get negative five divided by four times two, which is eight. I get negative five eighths, the exact same answer that I got up here. Harder, easier, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Although I, maybe the green might be a little bit easier than the blue up here. I mean, the common denominators aren't quite as ugly as they were up here. I don't know, I guess it's just personal preference which one you like. But really the point wasn't to try to make the argument that this way was easier or harder than the other way, just that it's another equivalent way to figure out the derivative. It's called the definition of the derivative and it might be useful to you at some points to have two different ways to solve a given problem.